Patricia. Uh, David Ash is vacationing, so he is not here. But we have some very special guests here tonight, but let's get things going. I'm Pastor Tay, welcome tonight. I'm sitting on the hot seat. And uh, this is Live Streams. And Live Streams is about you. It's about your life. And it's about the Word of God in your life. In fact, Psalm 1 talks about that. How the blessed man is described like a tree that is planted by the streams of water. In other words, he's planted in a good place where the refreshing streams come through the roots and like a tree that is strong by that stream, your life is strong because the word of God streams into your life and so life streams. That's what it's about. And so we've been presenting life relevant topics. Hopefully you are finding that relevant as we go through these uh, mini series. We're gonna continue on our series right now on anger. And uh, look at that angry guy on the screen. He is angry at God. And that's how we started the series. And then from there, we talked about anger towards each other. And then tonight, we're going to talk about some pretty serious stuff, domestic violence. And then next week, a very special presentation on child anger and teen anger as well. And so the junior hires are going to join us next week with all of their fancy gadgets, texting devices. I even told my son, you know what? You bring your iPod because next week we have a very special guest from Alabama who will be Skyping in. He has written two books, one on child anger, one on teen anger, and he'll be taking your questions via texting and live. So that's next week. But we're going to continue on talking tonight about domestic violence. Now, I don't want to turn it into, you know, just the, the guy that beats his wife, okay? I want to broaden it to include all kinds of things. I mean, there's uh, guys that are getting abused by their wives, okay? There's child abuse. There's also elder abuse. You know what I'm talking about? So the elderly get abused as well. So this is a broad spectrum and Lord willing, in our short amount of time, we will be able to cover it. But before we get the show on the road, we're going to spend about five minutes introducing all the people who are going to participate tonight. We're going to start off right here in the front. He is part of our Interact group, and we haven't seen him live yet because he has been busy chasing bad guys on the street. Well, actually, I don't know if it's him or Officer Gus who is doing the chasing. But uh, we are so glad that they are here live for the very first time. I'm talking about Officer Raul Alarcon and Officer Gus. Okay, let's give them a big hand. And come on up. And uh, he's taking a bow. So, Raul, that's your seat right there. And uh, Officer Gus, you can relax on the stage right over here. Okay, so there you go. Okay. All right, so he is ready to go. Oh, he got a special tree. Okay, good. No, 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 no. I'm watching my weight. <laughs> well, just just a quick review because we're actually making good time. I think it's the first time in the history of live streams we're not behind schedule. But uh, <laughs> see, now Chris, you brought the biscuit and he wants another one. What are you going to do? All right, but. Uh, uh, Officer Raul, we, I didn't invite him just because he's a policeman. Although being a policeman, uh, Raul, you have encountered, I'm sure, so many domestic violence situations. And I'm sure it has really impacted you in a number of ways, um, physically, emotionally, but spiritually as well as you are a Christian who is uh, concerned about really sharing the gospel, the word of God, and counseling. So there's another whole dimension to you, right, Rob, where you want the, the counseling to enter into people's lives as well. You can speak into the mic there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, say a few words about that. Yeah, um, I recently have actually taken a more of an aggressive stance on bringing a little bit of hope into some of the calls that we, we go on. Because as, as you know, as police officers, we get there, uh, we get to... You know, meet the people that are involved in a matter of a few minutes, and we're supposed to know how to solve their problems. 
you know, in a matter of short time. And a lot of times we are able to break that ice and, um, and give them some real good sound advice. And um, later on when we get into some more discussions, there's a lot of other stuff that I can bring to the table regarding uh, a little bit of uh, revelations regarding um, the cycle of violence uh, that exists out there. I have an illustration for that that's real quick and simple for you to view. Um, but when I have the opportunity, and there's a little bit of a light in the discussion, um, when it's appropriate, I, I do um, extend prayer to the victim. A lot of times if it hasn't gotten to a point where somebody's going to jail, I'll pray with the family, with the children. Um, so I take it a little bit beyond what most the, what the average police officer would do, so. All right, I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, we're really glad that you're here tonight. Okay, good. He is such a good dog, okay? I mean, officer, okay? Great to have Officer Gus. How long have you uh, been together? Uh, for four years. Four years, yeah. awesome. Okay, great. Let's well, you guys, okay. <laughs> we knew he was going to steal the show tonight. We still have five minutes to go before we video conference our special guest for tonight. He is Dr. John Street, who has just tons of experience in counseling people in many different areas, even domestic violence. And so we'll be calling him in about five minutes. But uh, before we do, I have two more special guests that I want to bring to the stage and put them on the special chair over here. The first is another officer who has just as much experience. Um, in fact, he is now retired. A lot more. You all know him. <laughs> Officer Bill Davies is here with us tonight. So Officer Bill, where are you? I can't see you. Are you here? There he is over here. Yes. So Bill, welcome. Okay. So Chris, crank up his mic if not ready to go. But Bill, we're glad you're here tonight. We know that you've made presentations at churches already. But uh, you kind of have a background. And you've seen, unfortunately, you've seen a lot of stuff out there. I have. Uh, after 25 years with the Riverside Sheriff's Department, I started off as a deputy for six years working patrol. And then I got into as a crime analyst, uh, became a profiler, working on a serial killer case, dealing with families of victims, and then 18 years in forensics. And uh, seeing it all, everything from elder abuse, where domestic violence has turned extremely violent, uh, where we turn, it's turned into homicides, where murder-suicides of the whole family. And then dealing with the families that are left with uh, the outcome and working with the, uh, we have chaplains with our department and working with the chaplains and again, praying with the families and the victims. Okay, well we're really glad. Aren't we glad to have Officer Bill here tonight? Yeah. Well, we have last but not least, a very special in-house guest commentator. She has an extensive background working with children who have been abused physically and sexually. And I, I just think it's great that we can ha add that dimension as well. She is Peggy Ta, who is sitting in the back. Let's give a hand for Peggy. Peggy, come on up. Okay, so this is our group, just, just a wide variety of people. Thank you, Peggy, for, for coming tonight. But what a pleasant surprise. You were talking to my wife just casually last week about your experiences, and when I found out, I had to give her a call and invite her onto the stage. But Peggy, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, your background, and, uh, and how this topic is very relevant to you. Well, when we left Orange County, we moved out to um, Banning Beaumont and the village of Child Help USA is in Beaumont and I knew it was there and I knew that the Lord wanted me there so I spent 15 years with the oldest boys who these children are taken away from their parents legally they live there for at least two years trying to rehab them and I just had the pleasure of 15 years of loving them. I probably had a total of 75 in all wow. over the 15 years. They were the most wonderful kids I've ever known, and yet people in town thought they were criminals. Mm -hmm. But I got finally talked them into child help ahead of it to take them home with me. And uh, they can never spend the night because they're wards of the court, but I got to take them home 
treat them like I had my own, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me, and hopefully I was able to touch them. So um, can you describe just generally what kinds of situations these kids were involved um, in? Some were suicidal. Uh, one boy, um, his mother, the, he and his little brother, he was three and the brother was two, he took care of his little brother, tried to find food, they ate out of garbage cans, and I know people say this never used to go on in this country, it has always gone on. His mother held a gun on him, and as a result, by the time he was taken away, he tried to commit suicide. He tried one day to jump off the roof of the administration building out there. And, um, and I got to hold him and try to talk him down. He was the one I used to dry his hair at night and he'd almost go to sleep because I was just touching him. And I had, I had wonderful experiences. I was blessed and I hope I bless some of them too. Wow, incredible. Well, we're going to, uh, let's give a, a hand to, to Peggy. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And yes. we're, we're, I'm, I'm looking at the clock because we have a very special presentation, but I do want to end the presentation a little early so that we can then hear from uh, all the specialists and even Trisha, who is taking the uh, text and the email. So we want to hear from you. I'm sure there's some rich experiences and yeah. insights questions. You guys know the texting number and the email if you want to write a longer one, go ahead and uh, send that in. And Chris is Twittering and Facebooking right now, so take out all your fancy gadgets and follow us right now on Facebook, okay? So here's our itinerary for the next 15 minutes, okay? It's not a lot of time. And I know our special guest is a little bit distressed that we don't have a lot of time, but we'll just have to make do with uh, what we have. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the profile. That's where we're going to begin. Profiling the, um, the abuser. And then we'll profile the victim. And then we'll ask some questions about the church. What can the church do to help? And then from there, that it can go in all kinds of directions. And really, Bill and Peggy and... Raul and Gus, okay, if you're not too hungry. <laughs> Your job is to just insert yourself when it's relevant, okay? I know it's going to be tough. Uh, John loves to talk, Dr. John, but we'll, we'll see what we can do to try to create a very healthy discussion. And of course, you guys on uh, Facebook, uh, put in your comments and things and, uh, and so forth, all right? Chris, you ready to go? You're Twittering, Facebook, and you ready? Okay, let's give him a call. Okay, this is Dr. John Street with, uh, I'm thinking he's got more than 30 years of experience in biblical counseling, and um, he is considered one of the nation's experts in all areas of uh, just sexual abuse and, and just many things, and uh, just a real personality, too. Raul, you remember, as we're calling him, you remember yes. visiting him. Yes. Tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that, and why did you go visit Dr. John? Well, um, <clears throat> I've, uh, I've had a long a long time a goal of uh, achieving um, my bachelor degree finally because I, I don't have it yet. <laughs> and um, Lots. and um, one of the things that uh, I had shared with uh, both, our, both the pastors here, Pastor Stan and, and uh, Pastor Tay, was my passion for marriages, uh, my passion for the family unit. And um, originally I was going to get a degree in psychology with an emphasis in family and, um, and, um, uh, family and uh, marriage counseling. And so I, I got to, to talking to Pastor Tay, and uh, he gave me some insight um, as to maybe a possible possibility of going to a particular location called the Master's College. Um, okay, and, that, uh, that's enough, Raul. You can say more later. <laughs> say hi to John, to Dr. John. You Dr. Remember? John, how are you? Hello. John, John, do you remember Officer <laughs> Raul Alakan? He came up to see you. That's the voice that you're hearing. <laughs> I do. Because now we were going to double Skype both you and him, but. He uh, surprised us by showing up live. So he is here uh, live <laughs> in person. You are on the screen. I don't know if you can uh, see me, but uh, what we have here, Dr. John, tonight is we have Officer Raul. We have his uh, canine partner, Officer Gus. We uh -huh. have uh, Officer Bill Davies, a retired police officer who's worked in this area. Um, uh, officer Bill Davies is here, and so you might hear okay. his voice. And then we also have uh, Peggy Topp,
who has spent about 15 years working with abused children. And so these are people, they, they may insert their comments along the way, but uh, we want to talk to you tonight. Thank you so much for making the time. Oh, you're very welcome. My joy to be here. I know you're really, you must be really tired from teaching all day. What did you teach tonight <laughs> at the seminary? Uh, oh, uh, this afternoon we had pastoral counseling. Uh, it went for two hours, and then marriage and the family counseling and went for another two hours. All right, okay. So, all right, good. Uh, those well, students keep me on my toes. Let me, uh, let me put it that way. Okay. All right. Well, this is what we're going to do. I emailed you kind of an itinerary, the broad topics. Let's start with profiling the abuser. I mean, what are your thoughts as you have counseled people in domestic violence? How have you come to profile this man or this woman, the, the mother, maybe the stay-home mom who has abused the, the kids? What are your initial thoughts about the profile of the abuser? Well, um, I always like to define things biblically. And uh, um, one of the key passages that I think helps to define what an abuser is all about is Proverbs chapter 3 and uh, verses 29 and 30 where it talks about, do not devise a harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you. Do not contend with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. That's a, that's a description of a, an abuser from a biblical standpoint, a wisdom biblical standpoint. And essentially, this is a person who has violated an implied trust. Um, now, the world doesn't always define an abuser as that way, but the Bible defines it that way. And um, everybody understands it. I mean, on a personal level, if you've ever had a private information that was shared by someone that you thought was a friend that should have been kept private, you felt the pain of that. There was, there was a betrayal that took place. There was an implied trust between you and your friend, and yet that was violated. That was very emotionally painful. Well, when you add to that any kind of physical or sexual um, abuse to it that even compounds the pain it makes things worse there is the implied trust is seen there in Proverbs 329 don't devise harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you I mean living securely beside someone or near someone or in some kind of relationship with someone where you trust them and then they violate that trust that is extremely painful that is uh, that emotionally marks a person. It doesn't have to for life. And that probably is the difference between people that I've counseled who are believers and unbelievers. You know, we teach, and I believe it's a very biblical concept, that all counseling is pre-counseling until that person comes to Christ. I really can't counsel an unbeliever over a long period of time because I'm, I'm going to give them what the Bible says about dealing with their particular problem. And at best for the unbeliever, the Bible is a set of suggestions. It's only, um, uh, it's only something that at best is a good idea, and maybe it's one idea among many ideas. And even if you got an unbeliever to follow what the Bible says in dealing with, for example, like abuse, even if you were able to do that, you, you'd be turning that unbeliever into a Pharisee. Because um, on the outside, they'll be able to function and do maybe some things that the Bible says that they ought to do. But on the inside, their heart's going to be far from it. And they're going to be doing it for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and so um, I think the primary characteristic of an abuser is he, he, he or she will violate trust. It's interesting. Um, I just did a seminar for this for the National Association of Athletic Counselors back in Indiana, where they had their annual convention. And there must have been, oh, I don't know, uh, six, 700 uh, pastors and church leaders and counselors there from all over the world. And I talked a little bit about this, and I had done a survey of all the counseling I've done on, in relationship to abuse. And in the 1990s, by far the most abuse that I had, or 1980s, I should say, by far the most abuse situations I had was domestic abuse between a husband and wife, and it was usually the husband who was the abuser. In 1990s, things switched, and now the majority of them became the woman who was the abuser. And, and that still is true to now. I don't necessarily suggest that 
my counseling load case is normative for everybody. But I, de I do think that there has been a major shift, culturally shift, um, when it comes to this particular issue. And there are a lot of women that are far more aggressive in this area in terms of violating trust uh, now than what used to be. It used to be this was almost totally, not completely, but almost totally a, a male problem. It's not just a male problem anymore. Okay, John, and, we gotta, um, we gotta and push women it on. dealing with children, too. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true with children. Yeah. Go ahead. I appreciate I'll that, appreciate John. I'm looking at the clock, and we've got a lot to cover. Just a yeah. real quick comment about um, about the profile some more. Do you do you see the the abuser as somebody who shifts the blame? Oh, he's, a, he's a blame shifter. Maybe he's... Uh, complicated in that he he sees that uh, it's somebody else's fault then it's not really his or hers they're just reacting to somebody else's problem do you see that complication with the abuser yeah yeah i mean there's all kinds of sophisticated ways that people can do that and contemporary psychology today um, gives them a sophisticated way to shift blame um, because they'll say well you know um, like, for instance, you get behavioristic psychology, Skinnerian psychology, and it's the environment that causes me to be this way. I haven't had the right proper stimuli in my environment to um, give me um, the popular or the, uh, the rewards that I will need in order to um, have the correct behavior. And so this is the reason why I do what I do. Or you could have um, Adlerian type of psychology, individual psychology, where um, you know, every, the reason why a person does what they do is they're compensating for an inferiority complex that was really given to them because of the way that other people treated them. And again, it all goes back to other people. Contemporary yeah. psychology goes out of its way to make people, uh, the perpetrators, victims. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. um, and when in reality, the Bible defines them as very responsible sinners that have the capacity to make choices. And oftentimes those choices are very, very sinful choices. Yeah, and that's going to be key in in um, in counseling them, right? Is to yeah. have them understand and take ownership of their sin. Yeah, you know, it's uh, take take the log out of your own eye first. Uh, that whole thing. Yeah. But uh, let's move on a little bit. And of course, Officer Bill, Bill you've got something to say. Yeah, this I'd is like, Officer Bill Davies. Dr. Yeah, I'd John. like to also comment. Um, when I was working patrol back in the late '80s, early '90s, I did see a shift of domestic violence where. It was primarily the men, but then it shifted to the women. Then when I got into the forensics division in 1992, I noticed that a lot of more violent crimes within the family were occurring with the wives, and we started seeing more murder-suicides mm -hmm. with the wife or the mother as the suspect and the husband and, of course, the children as victims. So I did see that shift during that time period, what uh, you were saying. Okay. Boy, that agrees with my counseling load. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, we have to move things along. Uh, everyone, let's focus on profiling the victim. Is there, as you're counseling and encountering the victim, are there things that are important for us to understand concerning the victim? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of things like, for example, how the victim or victims are oftentimes reluctant to come forward for a number of reasons. So that plus anything else concerning the uh, profile of the victim. What are your thoughts, Dr. John? Um, sorry, I was a little bit distracted there. All of a sudden, the phone rang here okay. next to my desk. And <laughs> yeah, we know you got a busy life over there, but yeah, I was thinking I about the, uh, the victim now. I'm trying to get or, it turned yeah. off as quickly as possible. That's all right. No problem. <laughs> so but, um, we're profiling the person who has actually become the victim. Is it, that it right? Could be the, it could be the spouse. It could be the children. Yeah. Um, well, All right, Peggy, you might have some thoughts about this. I don't know, but... So many of my boys had been victims of their mother's boyfriends. Yes. That was very, very prevalent. And mother did nothing. So she, as far as I was concerned, was an abuser, too. Okay. Well, uh, I know that one of the issues... University of Washington did a pretty extensive study on uh, dealing with victims, and especially in domestic marital abuse... And um, you kind of think that the person who's the victim is a wallflower, kind of a milk toast type of a person, but that was not the conclusion of the study. The conclusion of the study was usually the victim is, um, in this particular case, this where I'm just talking restricted this to marital uh, relationships. The victim 
oftentimes is very talkative, uh, very assertive, very demanding uh, person. It's just the opposite of the wallflower kind of victim view that we have a tendency to act and or to describe. And that's probably one of the reasons why First Peter 3 and verse 1, if, you, if there ever is a... Um, a book of the Bible that deals with the abuse, it has to be 1 Peter, because, of course, 1 Peter was written within the context of the Nerodian persecution. And during that particular time, Christians were being falsely accused of doing horrible things, and it was all false. And Nero, especially of burning Rome, and Nero was the one who had actually burn Rome in order to build bigger palaces for himself, but he accused the Christians. And so 1 Peter is written within that particular context, and a lot of Christians were being torn apart by wild dogs. They were being crucified. They were being covered with pitch and lit on fire to light Nero's gardens. Um, it was horrible. I mean, we're talking about um, excruciating death that came as a result of abuse. So when you read 1 Peter within that context, it changes everything. But in that, in 1 Peter 3, 1, he's dealing with wives married to unbelieving husbands. And in verse 1, he says, he talks about uh, you can win your husband over without a word by the behavior of their wives. In other words, your husband, your unbelieving husband, into righteousness. It's never going to work. It's going to drive him further away from Christ. And besides that, it's going to make him even more angry and responsive. And that's exactly what the University of Washington study demonstrated, that these, these women that are doing this are basically the type of women who are very, very sort of very verbal. All right, John, thank you for bringing in 1 Peter 3. I think that's important. Uh, no, notice, um, that, listen, we're not trying to in any way downplay or disrespect the victim. I mean, the victim is the victim, okay? But uh, he mentioned some interesting things in the study as, as well about the victim that might even be goading the violence or is not the wallflower, but, but might be stimulating that. I thought that was a very interesting uh, comment okay. as well. Here's the question, John. Is it biblically permissible for an abuse victim to seek protection? Oh, that's a great question. And the answer, the short answer is yes, but you need to understand this from a biblical standpoint. If you have your Bible there, grab it and just go over to Proverbs uh, chapter 22 just for a moment. And verse 3 talks about the prudent sees evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. So the Bible says that when you see evil coming, uh, the prudent thing to do would be to hide, to avoid the evil, if you will. Uh, a very similar statement is made in Proverbs 27 and verse 12. A prudent man sees evil and hides himself. The naive proceed and pay the penalty. And, of course, we've got a good example of that in the New Testament with the Apostle Paul in, um, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 32 and 33, where the whole issue, um, the people of the town came out to, to actually stone him to death, and he escaped. He, he didn't just stand there and just take it. He, uh, Self-preservation is, uh, is a very biblical thing. But let me extend it just a little bit further. The world has a tendency in secular psychology to talk about, let's say a person understands that they're going into a harmful situation, but they're willing to go in there for good reason. In this particular case, they want to win the abuser over for righteousness sake. Like I had a man whose wife threatened to kill him and did several horrible things to him. And I remember asking him, Dave, what do you want to do? And he says, I want to go back there and live with her. And I said, are you sure? And he says, yes, absolutely. Even if I said, even if it costs you your life, he says, yes. Now the world calls that, that person mentally ill. They're, they're uh, a codependent. The Bible didn't say that at all. The Bible says that that kind of a person understands that obeying God is more important than life. And if that abuser has the potential, and they have to have, they have, to have the right goal of, of winning the, or the abused person has the opportunity to win the abuser over for righteousness, and they're willing to take that, that's not wrong either. Okay, so but John, but what about, really, what about really yeah. dangerous situations for the wife and for the children? You started off talking about trust and, and what have you, but what if that trust is repeatedly violated and 
the home now is just incredibly dangerous, okay? Yeah. Then, well, then what? Involved, that's okay. a whole different issue. Now, now it's not unavoidable. Uh, the, the danger that they're going to walk into, yep. uh, we're going to have to clarify this uh, point where we are in this conversation, right? By saying that in that situation, hey, you, you just can't walk into that, right? Right. Well, when children are involved, of course, they're not making any personal decision for the sake of the gospel. They can't do that. So you're going to need to get them out of that situation. And of course, we have a... Um, a legal responsibility also to report that if there has been any abuse in underage children and of course that's what gets done and that's what we always encourage our counselees to do or counselors to do so when children are involved but let's say for instance you have an adult and they're willing to put themselves back in a risk situation uh, for the sake of the gospel now i don't view that person as mentally ill if they're willing to do that for the right reason um, if that's true, then we're going to have to label a lot of our missionaries who are in harm's way all the time around the world, in some cases in Muslim countries, uh, spreading the gospel uh, in terms of Christianity, and they're put in harm's way all the time. They're not mentally ill by doing that. They know exactly the reason why they're there, and they're willing to risk their own life in order to win those people over to righteousness. And when you've got a person who's like this, who is willing to, they know what they're doing. They're doing it for the sake of the gospel. That's really a, a good thing. But there's, it's not sinful for a person to seek self-protection. That's not a sinful thing to do. Because if they see evil coming, then it's prudent to hide yourself. And John, John can I reason. segue in? You, you mentioned something about... Uh, reporting it and what have you, and we've got police officers here, you guys can jump in, but um, John, what about the church, the role of the church, and and what, what can the church do? At some point, the church has to, if they see, I mean, uh, black and blue marks, I mean, broken arms, they gotta get the person medical aid, plus they gotta report, right? So can you just uh, give, uh, give us a good 60 seconds on the role of the church, that's all we got. The role of the church, okay? And uh, we've got some police officers that might be able to jump in on that. And uh, when all of that also breaks down, I mean, Peggy, you've, got, you've dealt with what happens when everything breaks down, the kids. But, John, what's on your mind concerning that? Well, when a felony has been committed against another adult, that's a crime. And that's a reportable crime, and it needs to go there. And, of course, when children are involved, I mean, even if a counselor suspects abuse, that's the way the, the law is defined, even if that's the case, they need to report it. Now, we always encourage our counselors to report it to the local police uh, because I think oftentimes we've had situations where when it's reported to other agencies, then those other agencies have a tendency, they believe a person is guilty until proven innocent, where the police are trained much more fairly where a person is innocent until proven guilty. And so we encourage them to report any, any kind of abuse or suspected, especially child abuse, to the local uh, police because they're usually quite a bit more fair-minded with it. And uh, because the Bible warns, on the other hand, that we don't want to make false accusations either. That's just as sinful on God's part. So uh, the judgment call is what is suspected. Uh, what, what is the su suspected abuse? Well, if you suspect it and it is a, it's a serious um, uh, suspicion that you have, then you need to report it. You're if you don't, then you will go to jail if it comes out later that it was genuine abuse and you didn't say anything about it. Time flies so, when we're having fun, John. <laughs> yeah. But um, listen, uh, one last question and we got we to gotta go. And uh, you've been just awesome and so generous with your time, especially being so busy and tired. But one last question for you, and that is, could you kind of summarize, I know this will be difficult, but what you can do when you have an abuser in your office, how are you going to help this person? How are you going to get that person moving in the right direction? How can you help that abuser? All right, quickly, you've got to help that person understand why they react the way that they react. Usually... This goes back to an anger issue, and that anger issue goes even deeper into the heart and the heart's desires. This is a type of person who has things that they want to happen that's not happening, 
or that are, sometimes there are things that are happening in their life that they don't want to happen and they have elevated that particular desire above their desire to serve God and love God and love others. And when that happens, they're, you need to help them as a counselor see the issues of their heart and that they need to repent of those issues. And genuine repentance is a change of mind that is so complete that it leads to a change of life. In other words, they're going to implement into their life substantive changes that you're going to hold them accountable for in making when adverse circumstances um, present themselves and their nature, their human depraved nature, wants to respond in violent anger. And by the way, this is a, it used to be, the thinking used to be as a result of Adlerian psychology that the reason why people did abuse was because they had very low self-esteem. Now, even secular psychology has demonstrated that to be wrong. That is never the case. It's never the case in the Bible. The reason why people abuse other people is because they are full of self-confidence. They're full of high self-esteem, and they've got to repent of that. In fact, they're so sure of themselves, they're willing to be violent with other people. There, there is a substantive issue that they have to see and repent on before God. So in Again, other words, it's inside them. It's not the wife. It's not the kids. It's not the dog, okay? It's right. them, right? That's right. That's exactly right. All right. Uh, this is something that they've got to see as a personal sin and a choice that they make and that they and as soon as they own their own responsibility for their feelings and action then they're free to change as soon as they do that as long as long as they blame other people it's what my wife does what the kids do it's what the dog do, does as long as they blame other people they have no freedom to change yeah john um, we've run out of time you've been very generous with yours i appreciate thanks. it so much We'll look forward to Skyping you again, but go ahead and enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you so much. Let's give Dr. John a big hand. I'll look forward to seeing you someday soon, and uh, I'm sure you'll see Officer Raul very soon, okay? Thanks a yeah, lot. Yeah, we're going to have lunch together, I think. I'm sorry? We're going to have lunch together, I think. Oh, good. Are you going to take him to that place where you put the barbecue sauce on the salad? <laughs> yes, yes. I love yes. that. You're the only guy Still that I know fire. that does that. Barbecue sauce on salad. Okay, we'll look forward to that, okay? All right. Thank you so much, All Dr. Right. John. Bye bye. Good night, Dave. Okay. Bye now. Thank you. Okay, well, we've got a few minutes before we call it a night. And of course, if you don't have a little one or a junior hire, we've got a prayer meeting over there uh, for about 30 minutes. You are more than wel welcome to come if you can't. Put your prayer request inside the box, and we'll take them and pray for you there. But we have distinguished guests here tonight. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts based on that. We've covered everything from the abuser to the victim to the church to, to how we can help. And, of course, every one of them are huge uh, cans of worms. Um, everybody, and we've got questions here, too, Tricia. But, Bill, why don't we start with you? Uh, give us some of your closing comments right now. Yeah, I have to agree with Dr. John. It comes from within the heart. And I've dealt with so many people when I was working in law enforcement, forensics, that um, uh, a lot of it had to do with drugs and alcohol and something on the outside, a substance from the outside was causing them to change. And the individual had to look at what's mm -hmm. causing them to act this way and, and violently treat their, their children or their spouse, and they have to change. And that's what he mentioned, that the... Um, the abused, a lot of times they'll go back to their spouse and they try to work it out. And if the abuser is willing to work and try to get clean, sometimes it changes their personality completely. And when I was working in patrol, I used to work a lot of child abuse, a lot of um, marital abuse uh, cases, where I used to go in, take my uniform off, put my civilian clothes on, oh. sit down with the kids on the floor, okay. and actually do the investigation for the investigators, put together a case. Because when a lot of times children are very, um, they're uh, intimidated by uniform. Yeah. And when they're comfortable and you build up a rapport with them, you, it's amazing how much information you can get from them. So I used to do that as a deputy, and then in forensics, I did more of the documentation with the photographs and the evidence collection. But uh, it was very rewarding. Well, Officer Bill, we want to thank you for your work in the community and for the Lord, and thank you so much for your participation tonight. Thank you. Um, Peggy, your thoughts. I'm sure you had a thousand thoughts concerning well, the what, other end, the children. What um, I didn't hear was that so many people who are abusers say it's because this is how they have been brought up. This is their big excuse. 
Uh, it was yeah, done it's to part me. of the blame shifting. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's the blame on somebody else. It was their parents. Their parents did it, so I have to do it. And I just grew to hate that. Mm -hmm. There was only a couple times I met any of the parents because they these children were legally taken away. Um, they came up there for something, and one of my staff said to me, "You're going to learn to hate here." And I said, "I think I already do. I knew what he was talking about." And I just felt suffocated by being near these people. And there are always other siblings. And sometimes they still had those siblings with them. And right there at lunch, they were abusing them. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, Peggy, in your case, you bring a very unique perspective. It must be incredibly challenging and rewarding to try to kind of instill hope in these kids that are just so broken down and must have lost yeah. all hope. That's why after five years there, I could take them out with me anywhere I wanted to go. There's nothing to do in Banning and Beaumont. And a lot of times at night, there is, it's not safe. But um, I, they let me take them home. They said, oh, you've been here forever. In fact, I was asked to do things that only the staff did because I'd been there so long. But um, when I took them home, that's when you could give them the hope. They thought we were rich because the house was prettier. There's that. We went to Home Depot and told them, you pick a color of paint, you buy paint. They didn't know anything about things like that. And I would constantly tell them, when you're grown up, you can live the way you want. It doesn't matter what you've been through. And that, and I could talk about the Lord with them. I was free to do that. What was the, what's the age of the youngest kid that... Uh, when I first went there, it was two, but then two they upped old? it to six. And it mm -hmm. was from six, finally to 13. But this lady that's going to talk next week, I, I know where she's coming from. At 12, they're out of there. Oh, you're talking about the Women's Fellowship Yes, and workshop. at 12, yeah. they're uh -huh. out of child help, out of most places, mm -hmm. if they can find a foster home, if they can find a group home. That's mm -hmm. where they go. We had boys come back, and, and I'm sure some of the girls, from foster care. One of my boys had been in at least 12 or 14 homes in a very short time. Oh, my. One of his foster parents held his head in the toilet and flushed it. If he didn't do farm chores, he was like five years old. Terrible. at the time so um, there's a great need of foster homes there and is. good group homes and at 18 they're on the street Peggy you've done great work and I, thank you so much for coming and it sharing it was my yeah. blessing all the way through thank I you gained, so much I got so much from those kids mm -hmm. thank you well over to this side we've got Trisha who's fielding your texts and emails but officer Rao uh, what are your closing thoughts do you have any thoughts? Or, okay, you want to take oh, a question? Sure. All right. Maybe it's something you guys can comment on since, you know. Um, we pretty much touched on some of these now that I'm reading them. You, you pretty much touched on a lot of these too, but um, the two I got when we're profiling the victims, um, sometimes the victims think the world doesn't care about them and that their world is the abuse. That's all they know. They kind of have that tunnel of whatever is going on around them, that's their life. That's it. Um, and for a child, being that you've worked with children so much, um, going back to the anger from, you know, the parents, say the parents are fighting each other, they're abused, they're, they're um, physically abusing, verbally abusing, the kids maybe aren't necessarily getting a lot of that abuse, but they're watching their parents fight in front of them. And from a victim standpoint, the child sure is going to know someday that they can live their own lives, but how do you break that cycle when all the child sees is the violence in their home? Even if it's not maybe hitting them, it might be. But how do you break that cycle of this young child always seeing that, that abuse, and how can we stop that child from becoming that? Well, that's what child help is trying to mm -hmm. do. <laughs> but it's very, very difficult and these children were all very abused and mm -hmm. molested, most of them. Because mm -hmm. um, I used to love to go around at night and hug them as big as they were and give them, give them a kiss on their cheek and say good night because the staff didn't have time. And at first, I wasn't supposed to do it, and I didn't know that because of the molestation. Mm -hmm. But they loved it. And so from the first night on, I was given, you know, just go ahead. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to break that. It's very hard to break that. And they all have been very abused. And almost none of those kids were with a set of parents who were married. Mm -hmm. That is almost unheard well, of. Well, I'm thinking, Peggy, mm -hmm. just the fact that you did cross the line in a good way 
and went beyond what they asked you to do, inviting them to the house and showing them yourself, your life, your home. That, I think, must have done wonders in showing them what Trisha's talking about, that they've never seen I any hoped, positive examples I of I hope we things. could plant a seed, because we had pictures of our kids on the wall everywhere, and they, did, they couldn't understand that our children were all grown up, and we had grandchildren. And some of the saddest things would come out of them. One of the boys said to me one night, who are they? And I said, well, those are our three sons and our daughter. I think they were their high school graduation pictures. And he said, do you ever see them? And then I had a poem on the wall about when, when you fall, pick them up, when you do this, when, you, when he cries, hold him. And he stood there and stared at that and repeated it and repeated it. Wow. And you're always having your heart broken, yeah, but yeah. you know what I hoped we were able to plant uh -huh. a seed. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure all of you guys have great stories. We're way behind schedule. Is Unless there's something, can we flag them for next week? That's We've it. got a. There, I combined um, them all. Into okay. That oh, question. is that what you did? You were summarizing there. Great <laughs> I job, Trisha. It. Uh, next week, we have. Um, mm -hmm. Next week, we have a very special presentation, and it's kind of a bring your friend night because we have a special guest from Alabama, and he is going to do what we did tonight. We're going to talk to him. He has written two books. The one on the left, The Heart of Anger. Uh, was the one that started it all. It's actually uh, forwarded by John MacArthur there. You see that? Um, Heart of Anger was written for children and how angry children are. Everything from whining to temper tantrums to throwing to really hurting people. To then the companion handbook, uh, Getting a Grip, uh, is the teen book on, uh, uh, that's connected to that. And so I asked him to do two sessions. Hopefully we can finish it in 20 minutes. We'll have the uh, a junior hires uh, invited as well. That's uh, Dr. Lou Priolo. So we'll get the uh, advertisement to you. So all, to all you young families, uh, bring yourselves. And if you got kids in junior high, uh, bring them as well. And for you grandparents, bring your grandkids. And it's just going to be a great night. Bring your children, uh, adult children as well. It's going to be a great night of hearing it. But one last time, I want to thank Officer Bill. Peggy, Officer Raul, you wanna, you have one last comment? Yeah, I, I'll take about 120 seconds if possible. Okay. I just wanted to, I'm, as I'm sitting here, you know, I wanted to let uh, Dr. John Street give his input because he's on Skype and everything. And um, I'm trying to think of what I can tell you folks here that are present um, in a nutshell that you could take with you with hope and uh, because we all have a sphere of people that we, that we go out and we touch, whether through your personal contacts with them, um, or knowledge through friends of friends, coworkers, neighbors, what have you. And I know all of us have come across somebody with domestic violence issues in their families, or um, you just know of, uh, about it. So you ask yourself, well, what can I, what can I possibly do, me, you know, little old me who has a, a job at wherever I do, and I come to church. And so one of the big things, I'm a visual person, so I mean, this you can find on the internet. And this is called the uh, cycle of violence. Now, I learned this in the academy. Uh, you know, I'm sure all the deputies and officers we go through this uh, training um, because we got to know a little bit about everything. <laughs> so, domestic violence. Um, it starts with the here. It indicates it's the buildup or tension um, leads to explosion, and then the cycle continues where there's remorse. The, you know, the abuser's remorseful, uh, even the victim becomes remorseful because they start, you know, talking about like they, they deserved it or what have you. And then the hearts and flowers, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. Here, I, I wrote you a card. I'm going to take you to your, to your favorite dinner spot. And then the cycle continues, and it's a never-ending. And so I've, I've been in, in homes uh, as an officer where I'm able to quickly draw this circle, label it for the victim, and, um, and let them know that that the only way for them to break this is to simply one day make a decision where you just break that circle and you decide to step out and you encourage them through faith, you encourage them through um, uh, nurture, through support, through follow up, because they need somebody in their corner, you know, and they feel all alone. The minute you leave or you hang up that phone, they're back into their world. So with a follow up, maybe a, a follow up email, text now, you know, all the ways we can contact people, um, it could definitely help. And, um, and then the other thing that Dr. John Street touched on, 
was regarding when you're talking to a non-believer versus a believer. Us as Christians here talking to, amongst Christians, we have a whole nother view of how we view the world, okay? And because we know who Jesus Christ is and he's our Lord and Savior and we, have, we walk around with this Bible that's the instruction to life, you know, and how to live our life and, and how to correct it and how to raise our children and everything. But when you all of a sudden, like last week, when I'm talking to a, uh, to a boyfriend who uh, through the victim told us that she's been beat up 10 times but she's never ever come, come, come to report it, I walked over to that porch and I was talking to this guy and I said, uh, I started asking some questions that could possibly lead towards me even possibly praying for the guy because he was not going to go to jail that night because there was nothing that occurred that night that I, we can take him to jail for. So I took it an opportunity to let me go talk to this guy while the other officers are dealing with everybody else and I'm going to see if I can maybe pray for this guy and give him, give him some, some good in, input. Well, lo and behold, he's a non-believer. Um, he totally went off of the, uh, another, another spectrum as I'm talking to him. So I knew at that moment I, I was not going to be able to reach him. So I basically told him, letter of the law, hey, listen, pal, if you don't do this, this, and that, you're going to end up going to jail, you're going to lose your children, and so on and so forth. So we have to keep that in mind. It's a delicate situation when you're talking to non-believers versus believers. Um, but that's, that's kind of, I just wanted to give you guys this little, this little take on the, right, the cycle violence. That. Hey, let's give all of them a big hand. All of them. Thank you so oh. much. <laughs> nice. And let's give Gus a big hand. He's been so patient. So patient. Good job, Gus. Good yeah. job, Gus. Yeah. All right, all of you. I, I know we took a little extra time tonight, but it was just one of those topics, okay? It's just one of those topics. Listen, um, we've got so many exciting things happening next week and then the following week. We hope that you will come out, or bring your friends, bring all the little kiddos up that are jumping up here on stage. It's just wonderful to see. Have a great night. If you're not in a hurry, please join us for the prayer meeting. Great night. See you guys. Bye-bye.